Good morning once again. We are ready to begin the second increment of our series, The Doctrine of Congregational Singing. <clears throat> the passage of scripture which is the foundation for this series of sermons is found in Psalm 96, the first three verses. <clears throat> This is what these verses say. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds amongst the people. I'm dividing this particular series into three major increments, at least to begin with. The first increment we covered last Sunday, and that is singing is commanded by God. The first thing that we want to take into consideration with this is that we don't sing just because we want to. We sing because we have been commanded to sing. We looked at the various forces which are involved in the commandment to sing, and apparently for a reason that we don't quite always understand, God wants us to sing and he's commanded us to sing because he likes it. We have taken note as we made observations through the creatures of our known universe that it is only the higher forms of life that are capable of singing and making melody. When we think of birds and dolphins, we know that they make noises, and that obviously they must make sense to somebody. When crickets rub their legs together, they're making squeaky noises, and the lyrics to their songs are, I'm looking for a mate. When dolphins make their noise, um, they are making noise about something to eat. When birds make their noise, it appears that they are tweeting, use a modern term, tweeting about maybe some tasty worm that they have found or maybe a piece of loose string that they can use to make a nest, but we really don't know. And it doesn't seem that birds act in a cohesive manner when singing is done. Now, we do know that there are such things that, as marmot whistles, and a marmot may whistle when he wants or she may want to sound an alarm that an eagle or a hawk is flying around looking for dinner and that is an alarm for everybody to head for cover. But God has commanded man to sing and man has intelligence, man has been endued with creativity and it seems that Man is able to make melody after melody after melody after melody, despite the fact that there are only so many notes that are available to us. We note that angels also sing, but apparently the themes of their songs have to do with the creation of the universe, and the grandeur and majesty of God Almighty. But man has been given the command to sing, to sing about the great deeds of God, to sing about the deeds that pertain to him as individuals. So singing is commanded by God. Today, we are going to be looking at the second increment, and that is that singing is a means of indoctrination. And let me tell you right at the very offset of this whole sermon today, it is my interest 
And it is my intent to get you to be much more involved in congregational singing than you have in the past. And that your involvement not be just in the corporate construct, but that it be from the inner self. Singing is a means of indoctrination. I suppose I probably should ask the question, what does indoctrination mean to you? And in today's parlance, indoctrination has become a bad word. It means that somebody has been washing your brain and that you shouldn't be thinking that way. You should be thinking political correct things because otherwise you've been indoctrinated and obviously only mentally inferior people are indoctrinated. Singing is commanded by God. We have seen that. And we want to take note of the fact that singing is a means of indoctrination. And we find this basis in Psalm 96 and verse 2 in the word proclaim. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. The second half of verse 2 is the basis for my telling you that singing is a means of indoctrination. Singing is a means of indoctrination, Roman numeral number 2. In 1964, a film was made. It's called Zulu. It's Michael Caine's first movie ever. Well, I guess he had bit parts before, but this is his first starting role. <clears throat> this is a story that is uh, based on a true historical event. And that event is something that took place uh, in the southern part of Africa. Today we call it South Africa as a country. South Africa, Natal, to be more precise, as far as the state or the province of South Africa. This particular film, I'm recommending it to you. Uh, look it up. You can still get it for free on TV. You probably will have to look at the commercials. But the reason that this film is important is because it brings to mind something that used to take place in the good old days. And that is that when a military unit was well disciplined, they sang. A military unit that wasn't well disciplined never sang. They could hardly keep the rhythm. And this is the story about 150 British troops who fought off over 4,000 Zulu warriors. Now, those of you that know something about African history, you know that the Zulus are the most powerful, the most disciplined of all the African peoples. There's no one who is as feared as the Zulus. Now, somebody say, well, what about the Maasai? Well, the Maasai are way further north. This is true. And they are known for their rite of passage and how a young man would become, or a young boy would become a man by uh, taking a lance and killing a lion. When he would come back with a lion kill, he was officially called a man. Very brave people, herdsmen. The Zulus were known for their militaristic outlook. The Zulus formed armies, they formed military units, and they had a system of rank, and what's more is that they sang. And if you happen to get this movie to watch, look at the very last part of the movie where the Zulus recognized that they were unable to defeat a small group of British soldiers. 
And the Zulus sang a song of honor to them. And the British troops sang a song back to them. And the song is Men of Harwick. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the colonel, you know that he took that particular tune and put Christian words to it, Men of Harwick. So, the name of the movie is called Zulu. And I'm trying to change the slide, but I can't. Let's see if this will do it. There we go. Zulu is a 1964 British epic war film depicting the Battle of Rourke Drift between the British Army and the Zulus in January of 1879 during the Anglo-Zulu War. It shows how 150 British soldiers, 30 of which were sick and wounded patients in the field hospital, successfully held off a force of 4,000 Zulu warriors. The medal that you see here is called the Victoria Cross. The Victoria Cross was awarded to the survivors of that particular battle. There were only 11 of them. It is the highest number of awards of the Victoria Cross in the history of the British Empire. The morning of the final attack, the Zulus approached within several hundred yards and began to sing a lament before launching again into their war chant. The British responded by singing the Welsh song, Men of Harlech. In the final assault, just as it seemed that the Zulus would finally overwhelm the tired defenders, the British soldiers fall back into a small redoubt in front of the chapel. With a reserve of men hidden within the redoubt, they form into three ranks and fire volley after volley, inflicting heavy casualties. The Zulus retreat. After a pause of three hours, the Zulus reform on the Oscarburg Resigned to another attack, the British are astonished when the Zulus instead sing a song to honor the bravery of the defenders before departing. The film ends with a narration by Richard Burton, listing the 11 defenders who received the Victoria Cross for the defense of Rourke's Drift, the most ever awarded for a single action. I want to call your attention that singing is very important because it does something to your mental attitude. It indoctrinates you. And you need to be indoctrinated if you're going to be tough. If you're going to be able to resist and repel gigantic, enormous enemy attacks. Let me make the songs of the nation, and I care not who makes its laws. Who else but a Scottish writer would do this? Now, it's true that Plato said something similar to this a thousand years before, but no one ever had these particular distinct words. Let me make the songs of the nation and I care not who makes its laws. How big or how small is Scotland? It's a tiny country, and yet that country is respected around the globe. Its people are known for their honesty, for their defiance, they're known for their loyalty, and they're known for their love of freedom. What can you say about the Scots? They sing. They are a well-disciplined people. What do, what's the police force in the UK called? Scotland Yard. Why? Because these are the most elite. These are the most disciplined people.
people in the kingdom. Andrew Fleischer of Saltum, 1655 to 1716. You can find this portrait in the National Galleries of Scotland. This is what Thomas Jefferson said about him. Thomas Jefferson thought well of him, writing, the political principles of that patriot were worthy of the purest periods of British Constitution. They are those which were in vigor at the epoch of the American immigration. Our ancestors brought them here, and they needed little strengthening to make us what we are. What the United States is, is because of the British concept, the, the concept that was brought over by, from Scotland by our, our guy. The famous phrase, a well-regulated militia, which is found uh, in the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution, is authored by him. We have a lot to reflect upon. And this is just for patriotism. When it comes to spiritual matters, the scripture says, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. There are three points that I want to call your attention from verse two. The first one is the word proclaim. The second is the word salvation. And the third is from day to day. And as uh, you are contemplating this, from day to day, it just smacks of indoctrination. Salvation, it is such a big thing. You need to study this. And proclaim, that is the verb. That is what we are commanded to do, proclaim. These are three key words that are closely linked together. They are word units. They, you can't take them apart. I mean, if you do, you do damage to the concept. But when they are together, they are proclaimed salvation from day to day. The word proclaim is the Hebrew word basar. Basar. The second word, the word for salvation, is the word Yeshua. I know that you're familiar with this word. You hear it in the person's name, Joshua, and it means salvation is of the Lord. Yeshua, salvation. And day to day, if you want to learn some Hebrew, this is it. Miyon leyon. Miyon leyon. Almost sounds like a Chinese dish. Miyon leyon. So let's begin with proclaim. The Hebrew word is the word basar. Basar. There's only one Hebrew word, but it takes three English words to get the point across. And what are those? Proclaim good tidings. It's not just proclaim, it's proclaim good tidings. Tidings. That's what that one word means. Proclaim good tidings. How do you proclaim? Is it that you go to a person who has never heard or to a nation that has never heard about Jehovah? No. This is what you do in the context of your own people, in the context of your own family. Proclaim good tidings. Now, before we move on, let me ask you this. When was the last time that you mentioned something to your children or your grandchildren? This is what the Lord has done for me. No apology. This is what the Lord has done for me. That's what this word means. Proclaim good tidings. The root meaning is to bring news. 
especially pertaining to military encounters. So the root meaning means to bring good news. This word has a related meaning. It's the other word that's pronounced exactly the same, spelt the same, it's the word basar, and it means flesh. And so the meaning is a messenger who has flesh and blood on the battlefield so that when he brings news, it's good news, it's reliable news. And so the import for you is that God is commanding you to give an account of how God has blessed you to your family, and that is to several generations, to your church, basar. And that means that you are a reliable witness. You've been there. You say, well, I don't know how the Lord has blessed me. Guess what? Open your eyes. Look into the Word and you will see that He has blessed you in what He ordains as the old him goes. The command to proclaim means that you should be a reliable witness or messenger when it comes to reporting God's salvation. Have you ever told your son, your daughter, or your grandchildren, I was so many years of age when I believed in Christ as my personal Savior. That is when I got saved. If you haven't done that, you're falling down on the job. Not, not so much that you're failing your children, but you are disobeying this particular command that God has given you. This isn't a suggestion. This is a command. To proclaim means to advertise. Well, we know what advertise means. But it also means to make something known. You say, oh, I don't know that I can tell the difference between those two points. Well, let me see if I can bring it together. David Huron is a professor at Ohio State University. I don't know. I'm, I'm from Michigan myself, but people like Ohio State. And he's a professor in the School of Music and the Center for Cognitive and Brain Sciences. So what does he say? He says that there are six purposes or six primary categories uh, in far as music is concerned, which include music has to have entertainment, it has to have structure and continuity, it has to have memorability, lyrical language, and it has to have targeting and authority establishment. So when we look at these things that some person who is not at all Christian or is not in tune with spiritual things, he is saying that if music is going to be good, it needs to have at least the majority of these things. Okay. Let me hold you back for a minute. Most of us are from the previous century, a long ways back in the previous century. So if I say something like, <clears throat> with a little bit of a tune, you wonder where the yellow went, and you guys know the rest of it, when you brush your teeth with, absolutely. How come you remember that? It's just a short little jingle. It's because it has all of these increments in it. Hymns, particularly those that are meant to be sung in a congregation, have better have some of these things in there. Otherwise, they are just empty repetitions that the pagan has. And you may like the empty repetitions, but don't call it worship to God. Call it something else.
Also, music in advertising can be used to appeal to a person's emotions and senses. Another fellow by the name of David Shirakelli of Voices.com uh, in uh, January of 2019 said this, the best length for TV commercials is 15 seconds. I think we all know that. We have these remotes for our TV, and if you push the uh, certain button, a little uh, icon will show up on the screen that says roll back 10 seconds, and that's because you're still going to get five seconds of that doggone commercial that you want to get rid of. 15 seconds. That's what it takes to have a memorable song or a memorable something. 15 seconds is currently the standard duration of a television commercial. So as for advertisers, they need to be able to successfully grab their audience's attention, which music does. Thanksgiving is this week. You know what's going to be on TV for the next 12 or so weeks or eight weeks? There's a little triangle that's made out of Hershey's Kisses, and they go like little bells, and they play a Christmas thing. That has been on TV for, what, 20 years? 25 years? They were going to take it off the air last year, and they said, no, don't take it off. We love that commercial. Why? That's the way it should be with Christian songs. That's the way it should be with songs that we sing in church. If the song doesn't have a melody, I say get it out. It doesn't belong. The flip side of proclaim. The flip side of proclaim. The flip side of proclaim is to have the subject matter become part of your own soul. In other words, this is that word basar. It's good tidings. It's only good if you consider them to be good. That means that it's got to come into your soul. Music has a way of piercing into the deep parts of our soul. These deep parts assist in our expression and response to God and to the church. If the words, the lyrics of the song aren't inspiring, aren't enough to spark that, we need to get rid of them. The history of hymn books is actually fairly short, it's a couple hundred years. And editors have been constantly saying, throw that song out, throw this song out, throw that song out, throw that. And there are some beautiful songs that have been thrown out. The words were marvelous, but the melody was not. In some cases, the melody is good. The words are good, but people get tired of it. And uh, we sang some of those uh, last week uh, at the hymn sing. And people say, you know, that's so last year. Music has a way, and we need to understand this of piercing into the deep parts of our soul. So that means that we have to be careful in what we sing. The gospel alone unites believers to one another. In other words, you and I are united, and we saw that unification as we partook of the Lord's Supper today. But singing unites us to the church. But singing unites us to the church. 
Music is the tool that allows us to do so. Okay, now I've been giving you point after point after point. We're on point D. And there's like a little Bible so far. But I want to give you the profile or the general image so that when we look at the Bible, we say, oh yeah, of course. I see where this comes in. <clears throat> Making the subject matter part of your soul is called indoctrination. So what is indoctrination? Indoctrination is making the subject matter part of your soul. How do you make it part of your child's soul? You have to indoctrinate him. So I thought that he was a free moral agent, that he can make his decision any way he wants. He can make his decision once he's 18 or 20 or 21. You know what that is? That's the tail wagging the dog. It's unnatural. It's not normal. God has given you as parents this particular command and this particular responsibility. You are to teach your children and grandchildren. And if you have nephews and nieces that hang out at your house, guess what? God has opened a window for you. You may wonder, why has God kept me alive all these years? When you count those kids coming through the door, now you have all those reasons. The word indoctrination has taken a bad rap due to those individuals that complain about their childhood education, catechism classes. I don't know how many of you took catechism classes, but I did. And I hated them. In fact, I don't know anybody who liked them. Everybody hated them. Hated them because it was just like going to school, but it was not school, it was church. And you had to do it once a week. Lutherans do it, Methodists do it, Presbyterians do it, Catholics do it. Why? Why did they establish that tradition of catechism? because this is the way that you pass your faith on to the younger generation. If you are surprised that your children are not following your faith, guess what? The complaining is very much like the person who complains about childhood piano lessons. It's difficult while a child, but it's rewarding as an adult. And so let me tell you, don't be like me. I was sent to piano lessons and I hated the bony fingers of my teacher poking me in the shoulder going, one, two, three, one, two, three. I hated it. I played hooky. My parents paid good money for me to go to, the, to Roosevelt University and take piano lessons. And I played hooky. I took maybe a year, but I only went to classes like, let's see, there's 52 weeks in a year. I probably went to class about eight times. I look at people who play the piano today and I say, what a reward that is to be able to sit behind the keyboard and to let the emotions flow through your fingers and how great thou art it comes out through your fingers. It is well with my soul it comes out through your fingers. What a blessing. But nothing that's worthwhile is easy. And it's the same way with catechism. It's the same way with learning doctrine. Indoctrination has its roots in the use of catechisms. Okay, what is a catechism? Well, first of all, there are two major catechisms. One of them is the Protestant one, it's called the Westminster Catechism, and the other is the Roman Catholic Catechism that is sometimes referred to as the USCCB. Everybody is called catechism. 
The Westminster Catechism is set up in a question and answer format. What is the chief end of man? That's catechism number one. That's the question. The answer. Chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Question and answer. The answer is followed by a Bible verse to show its validity. The Catholic Catechism is divided into four parts. I've got a picture of the Catechism there, a Catechism book. The first part is the Profession of Faith, that's the Apostles' Creed. Somewhere along the line you may have learned it. Second is the Celebration of the Mystery, uh, which is the Sacred Liturgy, especially the Sacraments. And today we did the Lord's Table. The Catholic Church has seven sacraments. We don't have any. We have ordinances, which means that the Lord ordered them. A sacrament is something that when you do such and such, that grace or merit is given to you. Or brownie points, if you want to call them. Life in Christ, including the Ten Commandments, and this is in Roman Catholic theology. And fourthly, Christian prayer, including the Lord's Prayer. How many prayers do you know? Well, if you're a Roman Catholic, you learn several. One of them is the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Catholic Catechism is replete with footnotes. If you have a Schofield study Bible, you will notice that there are footnotes in your Bible. The Roman Catholic Catechism has a truckload of footnotes that not only references scripture, but also quotes from the church fathers, quotes from the ecumenical councils, and other authoritative statements, especially those that were delivered by the popes. Okay, what I have just described is the way that our law library is set up today. You can go to uh, any law library or our public libraries and look at the law section, and you will find that a law is given, and then there are the footnotes. And this case was argued in such and such a time, and this decision was given. And then this Supreme Court judge gave this opinion on this. And then this was a time when this was overturned, and it'll have all those footnotes. This is the way that the Roman Catholic Catechism is set up. But this is where the greatest difference lies between the Christian Catechism, that is the Western, uh, the Protestant uh, Catechism, and the Catholic Catechism. The Protestant churches cite the Bible as their sole source of authority when it comes to church doctrine. It says, you must be born again, they'll give you John 3.16 or John 3.7, John 3.8, and this is our only source. They're not gonna say Pope Pius X said so. They're not gonna say Father O'Flanagan said this. They're not gonna say Mother Superior said this. You find that, in the Catholic Catechism, but you don't find it in the Protestant Catechisms. What you find is that the Bible becomes the only base, the only basis for doctrine. Would you please turn your Bibles now to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31. I need a minute to get there myself.
32 chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. The last two chapters were probably written by Joshua since Moses was already dead. As you know, Moses is the writer of the first five books of the Bible. This is book number five, and this is second to the last chapter. So as you are turning, the verses that I want to call your attention are verses 19 through 22. And so let me read those verses first, and then let's go back and get the context. So verses 19 through 22. And this is what it says. You're turning in your Bibles, and maybe I should uh, put it up on the screen because you don't have to say. Okay, let me begin to read verse 19. So Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, saying, at the end of every seven years, and this is not the passage that I was, I'm reading the wrong verse, that's, Explains a lot here. All right, verse 19. Let me put it at the top of the page and highlight it. There we go. Deuteronomy 31, verse 19. Now therefore, write this song for yourselves and teach it to the sons of Israel. That's the following generation. Put it on their lips so that this song may be a witness for me against the sons of Israel. Please take note of the fact that God is commanding that a song be used that would remain on the lips of the people of Israel and that God is going to use it as a witness. Verse 20, For when I bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and are satisfied and become prosperous, then they will turn to other gods and serve them and spurn me and break my covenant. Then it shall come about. Let me get this up here. Verse 21, then it shall come about when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify before them as a witness, for it shall not be forgotten from the lips of their descendants. For I know their intent, which they are developing today before I have brought them into the land which I swore. So Moses wrote the song the same day and taught it to the sons of Israel. Please take note of the fact that a song was used by God in order to teach the people of Israel. This is that group of people that followed Moses out of Egypt. Well, let's go to the top of the chapter and get the context. And the context is that Moses is going to die or has died, and so this is a recollection. So Moses went and he spoke these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I am 120 years old today. Should have had a party for him. <laughs> I am no longer able to come and to go, and the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross this Jordan. It is the Lord your God who will cross ahead of you. He will destroy all those nations before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua is the one who will cross ahead of you, just as the Lord has spoken. So you can see right here that there is a transmission of power. And in this case, the power is designated by the Lord, just as the Lord has spoken at the end of verse 3. Verse 4 
And the Lord will do to them just as he did to Sihon and Og, the king of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. The Lord will deliver them up before you and shall do to them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous, verse 6. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Let me just stop here for a second. Do you know that when a doubt comes to your mind or when your faith seems to be failing and you go to a counselor of some sort, that they'll say to you, well, let's take a look to see where you maybe failed in your loyalty to the Lord. Have you been praying every day? Well, not unless something happens. Have you been reading your Bible every day? No, not really. Have you been confessing your sin? No, not really. Have you done this or that or this other thing? And your answer will be, no, not really. Every one of those questions puts the blame on you. The scripture says that your success is God's success. And when you stop looking at yourself as being the cause of the failure, it's because you, then you will have good success. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Where else do you see these words? Do you not find them in the first chapter of Joshua? where it says that you will have good success. Verse 7. Then Moses called to Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall give it to them as an inheritance. And verse 8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you, forsake you. Do not be afraid or be dismayed. So Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. Then Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the end of uh, time of the year of remission of debts, at the Feast of Booths, when Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place which he will choose, i.e. Jerusalem, you shall read this law in front of all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, the men and the women, the children and the alien who is in your town, so that they may hear and learn and fear the Lord your God and be careful to observe the words of this law. Their children who have not known will hear and learn the fear of the Lord. Let me repeat that because sometimes it's easy to go over these words and, and I get their children, that is the children of that generation, who have not known will hear and learn the fear of the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. Verse 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the time for you to die is near. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting that I may commission him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. And the Lord appeared at the tent in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of cloud stood at the doorway of the tent. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. And this people will arise and play the harlot with strange gods of the land in the midst of which they are going and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day and I will forsake them and hide my face from them. Verse 17 is an awful verse. You pray to the Lord and he hides his face from you. 
But that's way different than the Lord lift his countenance upon you. He hides his face from you. And they will be consumed. We are looking here at the fifth cycle of discipline. And many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, it is not because our God is among us that these evils have come upon us, is it? In other words, it could possibly be. But I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they will do, and they will turn to other gods. Now, therefore, write this song. See, this command of writing the song of witness is because it is needed when you are so down and out that what you need is to reorient to the presence of the Lord and his help for you. Okay. Let's go back. The primary purpose of a local church is to act as a classroom where the Word of God is taught. The obvious method of teaching uh, doctrine is seen in the lecture format, that is, pulpit discourses like this one. But teaching is also to be achieved in the use of music. Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 through 22, Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. The two scriptural references that I just mentioned, or the scriptural messages, that I, the passages that I just mentioned, give us latitude to use a variety of musical notes. There are psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and melody making. We will get to these, though not today. These references make it clear that whichever mode is used, that it must be based on the use of doctrine in the heart, that is, your right mode. This means that there must be the active use of the intellect. Chants like Kumbaya do not rise to this standard. The active voice the, and the active use of the intellect has at least two facets. Let me give those to you here before we close. The first facet is Deuteronomy 31, 19 through 22. It serves as a witness. It has these two. The first one is the reception of doctrine, that is learning doctrine. It must be done, it must precede. The response to doctrine, that is the, aff the affirmation that doctrine has been embraced. So when we sing, the mature believer who is in the congregation is, is saying, I have embraced this doctrine. Obviously, the young believer who hasn't had any doctrine is going to be exposed to that particular concept. They're going to say, all these people have believed this doctrine. And because the Bible calls the sheep, it means that that person say, if so many people are believing it, maybe I should too. And the positive volition switch is thrown. With these things in mind, I want the people who attend our services to get or to exercise Bible doctrine from the moment that they arrive at the auditorium. When you come here, I want you to be able to orient to the fact that this is where you get doctrine. And you can cut everything else out that has happened to you that day or the week before, because this is the place that you're going to focus your attention on the Lord. I'll go over these points uh, next time as well. Although I don't believe that the auditorium is a holy sanctuary, that is, I don't believe that it needs to be policed with legalistic zeal, I do want the two and a half hours that we spend here 
to be full of doctrine. If people want entertainment, they can go to a concert or to a programistic church. Therefore, the songs to be sung should either teach a doctrinal point or evoke the affirmation that a positive volitional response is appropriate to the doctrinal point. And so with that, we, well, there's one more point I might as well get to now. The purpose for having music prior to the services and during the breaks is to provide an atmosphere of preparation for the function of your priesthood. Well, with that, we will close for now.